Hey, I'm Corey Wojcik, and you're listening to Audio Off the Shelf with your host, Greg Crow. Every Monday, you can get new episodes. You can get it wherever you get your podcasts. And now, here he is, my friend and yours, Gregory Elmer Crow. Hello, I'm Greg Crow, and you're listening to episode 12 of Audio Off the Shelf, the podcast where I play a handful of tracks from my physical collection. Everything I play on this show comes off the vinyl shelves in my living room, off the CD shelves in my basement, or out of that box of cassettes I keep on the shelf in the storage room. Today, I welcome Winnipeg actor Corey Wojcik onto the podcast, so some of the music selected for today's show will come off of his shelf. I'm very grateful to Corey for giving me his time, and we had a great session reminiscing about our friendship and the work we have done together. For those of you who don't know him, Corey is a veteran in the fine arts community in Winnipeg and is among the city's top theatrical talents. With numerous theater, fringe festival, and film credits to his name, Corey is one of the most recognizable names in the theater community, and we are blessed to have him. Last time I saw Corey perform was at a Rainbow Stage production of Mary Poppins. During an applause break in between numbers, my wife leaned over to me and said, Are you going to laugh every time Corey comes on stage? I replied, Yeah, I can't help it. The man is naturally funny. It's just one of the many reasons why he's one of my favorite people. One of the things I like to do on this podcast is share the stories or experiences behind the tracks before I play the audio. You'll hear me say things like, this song reminds me of this moment, or this musical technique is reminiscent of, or these lyrics hit home because, etc., etc. But Corey's experiences go deeper. One in particular is incredibly unique. There was a bit of awe for me in what he unfolded in our exchange, and I think you're really going to find his account pretty fascinating. So, without further ado, here is my conversation with Corey Wojcik. All right, Corey Wojcik, welcome to Audio Off the Shelf here. Uh, I, in the introduction, I talked a little bit about how we know each other, and I'm wondering if you want to kind of give your side of the story about how we met and, and came across one another. First of all, Greg, thanks for having me. Good to be here. A uh, uh, longtime uh, fan. Listen to every episode. Thanks, buddy. I'm not, I'm not just buttering you up. I really... I really have. I appreciate that. Thank uh, you. Yeah. And um, so we met because a friend of mine, Crystal Welland, was working there as a student teacher, I think, at the school you were at, uh, Nelson McIntyre. And he said that you were looking for somebody to write a musical because you had a CD of songs. And, and I had experience doing that working with Celebrations Dinner Theater. So that concept wasn't foreign to me because that's what you do. You just sort of take songs that aren't necessarily related and you make them into a musical. And uh, so then I guess he connected us and then you brought me this CD and I listened to this CD and I wrote back to you and I said, this is what I'm getting uh, from this music, which was also culminated with, uh, I had just gotten back from a tour, an acting tour with Prairie Theatre Exchange doing the Robert Munch plays for uh, young children. And we had gone up to a Northern community that was sort of uh, 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 closing down. It had been very popular. There was, it was a, you could tell at one time it had been a boom town for mines, but then the mines had closed and the, and the town had this eerie feeling to it. These really nice houses and they're all boarded up. So that was really on my mind. And then I met you and I listened to this music and I was like, oh, these two are, I can't shake it out of my head. These two are kind of marrying each other. And uh, so then, then I pitched you that idea and you were like, that's awesome. And that's that. That's the long version of how we met. Yeah, that was like, I have a lot of good memories about that because it wasn't sure if that was going to stick, right? Like I had this CD of music from 
Mitch Girio, a friend of mine in Toronto, who's a singer songwriter who I've, you know, a lot of uh, reverence for. And uh, I just uh, listening to his songs, I was like, there's a story in here, <clears throat> like in between yeah. the songs, there's something in there. And I don't have the skill set to, to pull it out of there, but maybe somebody does. And your name came across and um, that was, I think, like 2006 ish. And and since then, like we've become really good friends and I'm really thankful for your friendship and you're one of my favorite people. And uh, yeah, I'm so glad that we had this chance to do that project together and to uh, become buds after that. No kidding. eh? like for sure. And I feel I feel likewise. And, and um, I would say that musically I've expanded who I am uh, because of because of your influence. So uh, oh, thanks, pal. I wanted to say that. Um, Oh well, yeah, it was also very convenient that it was 2006 because in 2007 we did that musical, and um, I, I ended up student actually ended up because I, I was in education, so I ended up member, uh, yeah, student teaching at Nelson McIntyre, uh, so we got to work on that musical together. It was all kind of this fun, uh, unique, uh, serendipitous meeting uh, that was that rarely happens, right? Those those kind of moments are are golden in my mind uh, no, they, they truly are yeah it, it it felt like it was meant to happen that way like i'm i'm so glad it did happen and uh you know not everything about it was rosy either there were some tough moments in there which i'm going to ask you about as well but sure. uh like it was cool at the end of the day to say like we did this and we we invested a lot of time blood sweat and tears into that show and <laughs> you know it was it was a great show you wrote a fantastic script like it was really beautiful well, those the students the uh, who are now, like, if you can believe it, full on, like you know, when they're they're not just adults; they're like close to thirty now. <laughs> right? It's crazy to think about. You're right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they were amazing. When I think back, like I was, I was only like I was in my mid twenties at the time. So when I think back, I I don't know. I think I had something to prove. But now that I'm, you know, in my early forties, and I think back on those kids, I'm like, wow, they were so remarkable. And they had amazing, they were amazingly talented. And I, I also want to say that the, the actual funny thing about when I listened to that CD, the first song that really clicked to me, I'm a big Tom Waits fan. So mm -hmm. first song that really like that I was like, came in was that <laughs> London town where it's like, bang, 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 bam, bam, bam. Mm -hmm. I was like, what is this? This has got such a weights <laughs> kind of feel to it. And like, it was dirty and, uh, and, and <laughs> gritty and, and it, and it just like that bang, bang, bang brought like the demolition, uh, the, uh, wrecking ball into oh, my mind. Wow. And that's, and that's the first image. That's when I was like, this is what this musical is. Um, this is what's going to be. Uh, and, um, yeah, and that's, that's where it started. I'm learning something. I didn't, I didn't know that, that that's was your first impression in that, that sound that you, you, you had this uh, likeness to the wrecking ball, tearing down these brand new houses in this Northern community. Wow. I did, yeah. You didn't share that with me or I've forgotten. That's quite, I funny. never thought of it. You know what I mean? Like you don't, because I knew we were doing this podcast. I was like thinking, I thought about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and plus I'm doing another show where we're talking about being creative all the time. And so I'm of course thinking about the creative process a lot these days and, and what artists do when they're just beginning their, their creative process. And that's what, that's what was the first thing that was my, um, um, the launching pad for me. Now we were lucky enough that we had, we had some folks that came to the show and wanted to kind of take it to the next step. Like it's, it was great to do it with the kids. I learned a lot. They taught me a whole bunch. The students were fantastic. Uh, but then Jeff Kohut came along and he had like an independent production company and he wanted to do something with it. Like he wanted to workshop it. And but what do you remember about those moments where, where Jeff had approached us? <clears throat> Well, what happened was that I invited Jeff to come see it because I knew he was doing, he was just starting up that company or, or he was always looking for projects. And I did um, the Wizard of Oz with him. And I think we were hanging out and I played the CD for him and he was into it. He was into that music. And then he came and saw it and he was into the show. 
so it was really just an invite to see this show. and so he was like after that he's like okay hey, what do you want to do with this i was like i don't know what's the next step and and then he just took the ball and ran from there with white rabbit productions we had jen lyon we had sam hill we had simon miron we had uh the late great glenn thompson we had david warburton uh we had marina stevenson kerr uh uh charlene, charlene van Buch charlene yeah. van buchenhout uh, we had mike lyons <laughs> mike lyons yeah yeah that was for the carol shields festival put on by the prairie theater exchange which happened a year after we did the musical at the high school we, we did that and we it was action-packed and we had uh, uh lots of uh, great pros involved in that and uh it was lots of fun. I learned a lot from that. That was, you know, that was the first time for me too, in that sort of experience, uh, having a play and having a dramaturge. Remember, we had Angus Combe working with us. He was probably one of my favorite parts of that process because he, I don't know, he just had like a transparent vision for the show. And in, in a lot of cases, we were asked, um, the three of us, you, me, and Mitch, to come up with ideas and flush them out, like, and given a 60 minute uh, time frame, like we need an, a third verse for this tune and you need to figure it out like in the next hour, because we only have these actors for so long. So you need to write it in the next hour. Then we need to rehearse it the 60 minutes after that and get it, you know, out there. But this but was yeah. directed. Oh, we forgot to say that it was directed by Carson Natras. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Who is now the artistic director of rainbow stage. Yeah. And Jeff, who, uh, Jeff, is now like um i don't know that they i think he kind of runs things over there behind the scenes now yeah they're they're two major executive movers yeah. and shakers they, they pretty much run the place they yeah. run the place yeah so it was crazy that we had those people you know running our show um mm -hmm. but yeah angus uh he had some kind of vision for um helping us see through the panic and get to the meat of the problem for me as a young artist like i was still i think i was still young i was still a young artist i was still mid-20s right um and i and i'd never written anything like that um where where it was going into a a, a professional workshop so it was uh when you're when you're so entirely product based when i'm as i'm sure you are as a musician right you write a song and then you get it up to a good product. Right. Well, that's not what that workshop was supposed to be about. No, not at all. It's just about workshopping it. But the idea of, of workshopping it and putting it in front of a, a crowd not being fully completed was hard for me to wrap my head around. <laughs> you don't want people to walk out of a theater going like, well, that needs a bit of work. <laughs> but at the same token i did when i think back I, I wish people would have walked out of there saying well that needs a bit of work and i'll tell you what it is it's this yeah, yeah. Uh, but i think they were totally blown away by the music of it you had that full band we had mitch there we had uh who you have what's his name on horn frank oh frank burke frank Good burke Lord. who's uh he's a winnipeg legend you know in the jazz scene he's been the man's 83 years old like he's still playing uh yeah and he had such an affinity for that same tune you're talking about that london town tune like i i remember distinctly he grabbing a hold of mitch he's like come here come here i gotta tell you something man that song that song is powerful he was a great character yeah. Yeah. yeah there was a lot of there's you know i'm just thinking about it now and it's just sort of um, bringing a lot of joy to me um that you can't see on my face right now but it, it's uh, it's there it's there trust me COVID has made me a cold cold hard stone but um <laughs> but no just thinking back on it and um I do remember a certain moment in that workshop where you and Mitch are just going at it on the guitars and I just remember thinking to myself clock that one in there that that's a cool moment where mm -hmm. you and him were just like mm, 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 playing those guitars and um for rehearsal and and uh, the music, yeah, the music is great, man. And um, and that was that for that thing, eh? <laughs> yeah, that was it. Like, it's, well, it's funny it was... how it gained so much momentum and then uh, uh, it, it just kind of um, ended. It's weird, hey? Like, we said goodbye to, well, I said goodbye to all those actors that night. Almost all of them I have not seen again, you know? I see Sam on TV or whatever, but 
Uh, and, uh, you know, I see Simon every now and again, I'll run into him at Fringe Festival or something like that. And of course, I see you and I, I worked a little bit with Jeff, but all those people who you very quickly become friends with those folks, and then it's over. Goodbye. What you're talking about is called the post show blues. Uh, yeah, and it's uh, it, luckily Winnipeg is such a small and, and tight knit uh, community that we know it's just like, see you later. We'll, we'll yeah. be working on a different project down the line. That's it. Is the uh, the it's the beautiful it's the beautiful thing about theater. It's the the bittersweetness of it. It's not like a movie. You can't just watch it again later. Yeah, uh, you can't experience that again. So that's yeah. It's actually uh, the beautiful thing about theater is that um, it, it it especially right now when we're talking about COVID, we're and I've been thinking about this recently about how we're missing real time, how we're missing things that happen in real time. Absolutely. Everything is everything's now in digital and feelings are happening. Like whoever's listening to this right now, actually, they're not listening to this in real time. <laughs> yeah. We're 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 March 24th, 8:45 p.m. And they're listening to it whenever they're listening to it. So there's a separation of moments, not to say that that's still not a unique moment, but we're not sharing them together. And um, it's those shared moments that are really palpable for, for a theater artist, for me and, and for you, I'm sure as a musician, when you're out in the crowd and you're, and you're, and you're on that stage and you're playing something in and, and, and you can feel that magic moments that are irreplaceable. And that's what theater is. Indeed. Well, Hey, maybe we should play something from the show then. <laughs> yeah, nah, nah, nah. Tom Waits song. Here's Tom Waits singing. Well, why don't we play that London Town song? Yeah, I think we should, since uh, we talked about it so much. And uh, like when you hear it, there's a main melody line that comes in there, and it's being played on uh, the guitar uh, in this recording. But imagine, you know, Frank Burke with his trumpet with a Harmon mute in it, and he milked that rhythm for everything it's got. He manipulated it in so many ways, put his own touch on it. Uh, you know, he decorated it in his own way. It was, it was really beautiful. But it, you know, it showed there was a real connection that Frank had to the music. And for a musician who's been around for multiple multiple decades to have that kind of feeling about a piece of music says something about mitch's writing uh it's pretty special so we'll play london town um and this is uh this is like the the way london we town part two right part this two was, right so it london closed town. out the um the first act with this number right that's right and um, Mitch originally had written London Town 1, which was just him and an acoustic guitar. And then he wrote London Town 2. And we kind of used those two tunes as the framework for the musical London Town. So, I, you know, it's funny, like, I'm sure Mitch had no idea this was going to become a full-fledged musical when he wrote two, you know, three-minute tunes. But uh, that's how it kind of came to be. And then I think we'll uh, we'll play uh, Heavenly Enterprises, which was a tune that wasn't done with the high school version, but it came up in the workshop. And I'm, I can't remember the origins of it, but somebody uh, came to Mitch and I and said, we need a song in here that kind of sells this part of the show and moves the story forward. And Mitch, uh, if memory serves me, it was either in my basement when he was staying with us in Winnipeg, or maybe he did it in Toronto. I can't fully remember, but he just needed to get it out there. And he did this one take Charlie of uh, heavenly enterprises. Uh, and uh, you have to listen to the very, very end. Cause I don't think he was overly happy with his vocal performance. And he kind of <laughs> exclaims that at the end of the recording, but there's something endearing about that too. You know who it was that came to him and said, we need a song for this moment. You know who that was? No, that was me. I, I did that. It was me. That's a good intro. Eh? <laughs> Time is good as time is any, so get 
get your asses out Cause you don't got a penny I'm trying to close it up And you fed some too many Slept until the break of day Debbie lost a finger And Frostbite bit her best friend's face Some poor corporate bureaucrat But who cleans up when they're all gone Scrubbing the right out of their wrongs Reinventing heavens like Pawning someone's stolen bike Splash a little coat of paint, oh But please just don't call me a saint Taking off the safety brakes Removes a lot of needless ache So long as you don't feel too faint, oh Well, please just don't call me a saint No Everybody cries when some old man up and dies And they point their fingers at some poor corporate a bureaucrat But who cleans up after they're gone? Scrubbing the right out of their wrong Reinventing heavens like Finding someone's stolen bike Spatch a little coat of paint The police just don't call me a saint Taking off the safety brakes Removes a lot of needless ache So long as you don't feel so faint Oh please just don't call me a saint hey. So Corey, the audio off the shelf concept is, uh, I started this, this podcast because I wanted, first of all, I want to reacquaint, um, myself with my music collection, the stuff that's on my shelf, right? Cause I'd be walking past it from time to time and saying like, there's so much good music on here, but sometimes like there's so much of it. I, I don't know what to pull off the shelf. And so the podcast kind of gave me a little bit of uh, purpose in that regard. And I, I think you can tell a lot about a person by the titles they have on their shelves. 
And in the spirit of what Ian Mackay has done with Fugazi, where he's documenting all of all of Fugazi's live shows, all of them, um, and they're big on documenting the process, right? I wanted to uh, document my collection in some way, and I thought this podcast might be uh, a good way to do it. In, in some sense, I think like maybe after I'm gone, my kids will be able to access this library of episodes and grasp an idea as to why dad listened to the music he did. And if they want to take a deeper dive, they can then get into the collection uh, that's on the shelves so all of our music like there's a reason why we have it there's a reason why we go out and bought that record and we kept it on the shelf all these years Uh, everything's got a personal story attached to it so i'm wondering what do you have on your shelf that carries an endearing personal story what do you have for us okay so first thing i want to mention about your podcast and i was thinking about it and why what's actually quite quite amazing about the whole thing is that if you told me you were making this thing 20 years ago, I'd be like, okay, so what's your show? You're like, I'm just going to take music off my shelf and play it. I'd be like, so you're just, you just have a show about music. Right. But the fact is now that you have a collection of things, CDs, vinyl tapes is rarity. (laughs) I know. I know. So it's unique in that way that that what you're saying is absolutely true because um my son who's 18 does not have that uh my son who's 10 does not have that my son's a musician too he doesn't have a collection of of he doesn't have anything on his shelves musically um he's got it's all digital right yeah so he's not like you and me so it's it's really interesting how you know, because it would be like for him to be like, yeah, listen, I'm going to do a show and it's going to be all the music that I collect on my streaming service. And we'd be like, so you just, you're just going to play music. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not so unique. It's just like, it's just like a radio show. But the fact is, is that your music's like, I'm sure we could find your music on a streaming service, but you can't find it on your wherever you're. And some of the stuff I actually have been listening to, like, like when you played on a beach there, that was so cool because that's that doesn't exist anywhere else right so that's that's what's cool about it uh so anyway and okay so back to the to the your question about so uh, i grew up in a musical family my great-grandfather whose name was bill delorme was an old-time fiddler from southern manitoba in the area of pilot mound and uh, then my uncle uh my mom's brother uh, he plays in a band called damn straight in town so i i grew up uh, having music around a lot. Uh, so much so that like, uh, my big regret is that it was, you know, when it's around and you just sort of take it for granted, that's, that's what I did. I took it for mm-hmm. granted. I would, I went to so many of these old time fiddling contests when I was a kid and I, and I ran around and I was a little kid. I didn't, man, I wish I would have just like sat and just taken it in, taken in those concerts yeah. for the, for the beauty that they were. Uh, but I didn't, I was too busy, whatever being a little kid. Uh, So anyway, my, I always knew my, my great grandfather was, was a a good fiddle player. I heard him play. He was great. And I, and I didn't, it's funny. I didn't, it didn't occur to me how good he was until I heard a song about him that was written by another uh, uh, Manitoban artist who is known as like Manitoba's yodeler. And his name is Stu Clayton. And Stu Clayton wrote a song called The Ballad of Bill DeLorme, hmm. which is just about my grandfather. Uh, and it's just uh, uh, so it's funny because when I heard this, I was like, wow, actually, my grandpa is he's big time. He's, he's got a song written about him. I can't even get my head wrapped around that. Like somebody you don't know, Stu Clayton is writing a song uh, about your grandfather and you don't know Stu Clayton, do you? I didn't know him at the time. No. And I, and I still can't say that I do know him. And so when I was a kid, I said to my grandma that I wanted a copy of that song. And so they bought me a tape for Christmas one year. I don't remember what year. So I got it on tape and then they thought, so I played it and I played it a lot because, uh, oh, I played it a lot because my grandfather had passed away when I was about 10. So that's why I wanted to hear that song. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's there's this story about my grandfather. It just talks about him and it made and it and what it's done for me over the years is is uh, formed more of a connection 
to this man that I, I knew very little of. And it's also created an introduction conversation to my, uh, my own children about who he was. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, so my birthday had like a week ago. I don't know why. Uh, I don't know why I did it. The few days before my birthday, I listened to Stu Clayton's um, album with that song on it. And then on the back, on the liner notes, actually, it's funny. Your this podcast, reading liner notes, I never, I had forgotten. That's the forgotten art of vinyl, right? Yeah. Is that you sit and you read it and you look at the record and you read the liner notes and blah, blah, blah. And um, so I said on there, you know, I love hearing from my fans. If you want to reach out, you can reach me at Stu Clayton. And he left an address and it's a mail, right? Mm -hmm. And I'd watched biographies on him. Like he's a big hit. Stu Clayton's a big name down at the times changed. Like there's posters of him and, and stuff like that. And one time when I was on tour, actually, for another show, we, we pulled into uh, Morden and there was Stu Clayton on display, his, his, his CDs. So I bought his CDs and, and I realized actually when I'm preparing for, I have them on vinyl. I have two copies of this album on vinyl. I have it on tape and I have all of his, and I have it on CD and I have it on iTunes and I have it, <laughs> <laughs> I have it, I have it so many different ways, this song. And it's really, uh, it's really meant something to me. So I listened to it a few days before my birthday. And then on my birthday, I don't know what possessed me. I was like, I'm going to write to Stu Clayton. Two hours ago from when we're talking right now, I sent that letter. And, you know, Stu Clayton, he's, he's a remarkable guy because I feel like this. I, I don't want to misrepresent him, but the story is, I feel like he could have gone. He could have gone on to be, could have gone to Nashville or where, wherever, wherever you go to take your career to the next step. But he was steadfast. He was a steadfast Manitoban. He loved Manitoba. He loved the prairies. He's got a song where he just thinks people are nuts for searching out for the mighty dollar. The song's called Crazy People. And he finds people to be like, he just, he can't wrap his head around. Just He finds life. He takes great joy in the simple things. You know, I believe his wife plays the saw, played the saw. Uh, and he's the Manitoba yodeler. And, and uh, you can find, you just Google search you, Stu Clayton, there's YouTube uh, uh, documentaries, which I think were made by the owner of the times changed. So, uh, so this, this song, the ballad of, of Bill DeLorme ha has been a running emotional theme in my life that is connection to my grandfather. And I have old trophies that my grandfather won from these. Stu Clayton says in this song, like many old time contests, first prize came to his hand. Bill Delorme from Pilot Mound, the fine old fiddling man. And now so, those, those prizes are in your hands. Now they're in my hands. That's yeah. wild. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, uh, I get a little, like I'm even right now getting a, little, a bit um, choked up just, just thinking about it and uh, how music sort of can transcend past um further and farther than you can fathom i wonder i wonder if he's even thought about the ballad of bill delorme and when was the last time he thought about it yeah and so in that letter i'm just asking him to meet him because i kind of thought well i'll you know actually he did play a couple of concerts but of course being a theater guy we're running the same life you know if steve clayton plays he's playing at night and if i'm acting i'm acting at night mm -hmm. so there was a couple of concerts that i didn't make it out to see him and I kind of always thought, well, I'll see him one time and then I'll meet up after and I'll say, Stu, really, I really wanted to meet you. And I'll tell him my whole story. And then COVID hit and, and, um, Stu is, he's an older, he's, he's, he's older. He's, he's a senior citizen now. And I don't know. I don't know. I just sort of, as you get older, as you know, you're just like, I got to seize the day. Mm -hmm. You got to seize the day and just like take the opportunity. So I thought I'm going to send him this letter and and hopefully he reaches back but even if he doesn't even if i just know that he got it and he read it and he knows that he's had an impact on my life i would uh, be help happy yeah that's a fantastic story Corey. thank you for sharing that sure well here it is here it is the ballad of bill delorm by Stu clayton in southern manitoba in a town called Pilot Mound There's a famous old-time fiddler 
many years he's been around When it comes to old time music, he's mighty hard to beat When Bill plays his fiddle, you can stay off your feet Bill Delorme from Pilot Mound, a man we all know well He's been fiddling now more than 70 years, what stories he can tell At many old time contests, first prize came to his hand Bill Delorme from Pilot Mound, a fine old fiddling man He started playing fiddle at the tender age of nine For old time country dances in a schoolhouse down the line He played for the love of playing, many times he played for free If we had more men like Bill Alarm, this world wouldn't better be Bill Alarm from Pilot Mound, a man we all know well He's been fiddling now more than 70 years, what stories he can tell. At many old-time contests, first prize came to his hand. Bill Delorme from Pilot Mound, a fine old fiddling man. Yes, Bill Delorme from Pilot Mound, a fine old fiddling man. I do have my grandfather playing in one of the many times in my great grandmother's in their house, in their house in pilot mound. And, uh, sometimes he would have, uh, well, I don't even actually, yeah. Sometimes he would have, a some company with him. He had a piano player and a guitar player and he played the fiddle, mm, man. I wish it could be me. I wish I could be playing that guitar. There is a picture of me and him playing the spoons. Oh, I, sweet. He's, he's playing the fiddle. I'm playing the spoons. <laughs> I, that's what he, they used to get me to do. They used to get me to play the spoons. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the, here's a, here's a little something that, wow, it, it will sure make everybody so pleased to hear it for, in my family. Anyway, uh, some tracks, some living room tracks back when they used to have just a tape player and they used to just hit, you know, play and record at the same time. One of those things. So it's not yeah. the, the most amazing, uh, uh, you know, recording in the world, but, uh, it's raw. It's real. Build alarm playing one of the songs that he wrote and uh they're actually they were recorded uh by uh don messer uh let me just make sure that name is right don messer. it is you know it's funny you bring up that name Corey, because um you and i were talking before we recorded this and you were going to talk about your grandfather and i was going to segue into talking about my grandfather uh and i was thinking about a track to play and I didn't have a lot in common with, with my grandfather musically, except that we both like music, but he, his record collection was a lot of Don Messer records. Oh my, see. Yeah. And so on those records would be one of the songs that my grandfather wrote. There was three of them. One was called the pilot mound waltz. One was called the waltz of the roses. And one was called three men on a white horse that Don Messer recorded. That's crazy. Wow. It's yeah. really come full circle here on this podcast. So. Totally. So uh, I wish I could tell you which one it will be, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, here's, here's, here he is.
So Corey, we're going to move uh, ahead a few generations in your family songwriting here and, and, and stop at you for a moment here uh, be, because you're not only an actor, you're also a songwriter. Like I, I've been uh, watching you uh, submit like a weekly song project of some sort um, mm -hmm. that you've been doing. What, what is that all about? What it is, is um, I was playing in a lot of cover bands and I do a lot of creative things with the theater and whatnot. And I kind of thought, well, geez, if I'm going to play music, it better satisfy me creatively. And I have much respect to people and I still play covers and there's much respect to, to cover bands or cover groups, but it wasn't turning my crank. So I wanted to, and my friend, Ashley Gray, who is an amazing songwriter, had a bunch of songs. And I just thought, um, <laughs> much like London town, like these things and much like what you're doing right now, these songs will just sit on the shelf. We, we, we as artists, I think, have a responsibility to, well, not even to ourselves, to get stuff out. And that was like six years ago, right? And so I just started writing songs for, I don't know, I was just like, oh, let me just try this. You know, I'd written, a, I had written one song, remember, for, for London Town? Yes, uh, of course I do. Yeah, you, you made it awesome, but I kind of sent you this rough, rough draft. But um, so... So then I started writing songs and then she was like, that's great. It's good. So then we became a band, a songwriting band. And then we added the third member, Duncan Cox, and he brought songs. So we're like a songwriter's band and we just basically support each other. And we're called good show and we're called good show to remind us that that's why we're doing this is that when we're in theater we say to each other, Hey, good show, good show tonight, no matter what happens. We're just there to have a good time. So we just said, we need a reminder of this. So we named our band Good Show <laughs> to remind us that that's the point, is that we're just here to have a good time and to put on a good show. Uh, so here's a song that I wrote uh, for the band. Like I wrote it, but we played in the band. And we've been talking about theater. And as you know, you write what you know. So here's a song called The Game of Sacrifice, uh, which uh, I am loath to explain that it's about theater because, you know, when you explain your song, it could mean something else to other people. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, but this one's about just, well, no, you know, it's not about theater. It's about living the artistic life. And, uh, and it's just sort of like the things that you have to sometimes give up and the trade that you make and the sacrifices you make in order to, to maintain an artistic lifestyle. It's called the game of sacrifice. Dreams is more like picking teams, and who else 
Hey, Corey, thanks so much for uh, coming on the show. You're my first ever special guest, and it was uh, a real pleasure having you. Man, uh, you know, we're hearing every day about things opening up now uh, as it's it, COVID seems to be moving and trending in the right direction. But the last thing to open up are the theaters. And boy, do we miss that. And man, I think about you every time I hear about it. When something new opens up and they're releasing restrictions, I always think about, well, we got to get to those theaters because... Uh, our, our, our friends in that community really need that love. So uh, mm-hmm. I'm thinking about you all the time and I hope it's, it's going to tr- continue trending in the right direction so that you can get back to doing what you love to do. Mm, yeah, me too. And uh, um, you know, it's, it's definitely learned. I think we, we've all learned a lesson here that uh, we really can't take anything for granted. No. So when, when those theaters open back up again and we're all hitting the stage, uh, there's going to be a new added level of appreciation for and, and and gratitude for what we do, for what we get to do as artists, right? Yeah, amen to so, that. It's going to yeah. be a golden age for artists once we get on the other side of this wall. Totes. <laughs> <laughs> Corey, thank you so much. Okay, man. Thanks. Take care. Take care. After our conversation, I was inspired to head to my local record store and try to find some Don Messer records, those records that would connect to my grandfather and bring our whole conversation full circle. And while I'm here, I want to say, you should support your local record store, now more than ever. It's important to help these folks out. One of the places I go here in Winnipeg is Argy's. You can find them at www.argy.ca or at 1604 St. Mary's Road. Well, I wasn't able to find any of the three tunes that Corey was talking about, 
But I did find a double LP KTEL release that I immediately recognized from my grandfather's collection. You know, it's funny what the brain remembers, and this album cover is one of those stored memories. My grandfather was also a fiddle player, and I am now the proud custodian of his instrument that I played as recently as last week. So to honor my grandfather, and Corey's as well, as well as all fiddle-playing grandfathers out there, here is Don Messer playing Don Messer's Jubilee Jig. Thanks for listening. Audio Off the Shelf was recorded and produced in a little corner of my basement in Winnipeg. The Audio Off the Shelf logo was created by Benjamin Crow based on the original iconic artwork by Donna Parsons. Please write to the show at audioofftheshelf at gmail.com. Please follow or tag the podcast on Twitter at AOTS204 or on Instagram at Audio Off the Shelf. Thank you for listening. Let's go to the bathroom. I'll show you my hair. <laughs> I'm Corey Wojcik, and you're listening to Audio on the Shelf with Greg Crow. New podcasts every Monday. You can find yours at Audio on the Shelf on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> can you do this? it again with the right title? What did I say? Audio on the Shelf. On the Shelf? Yeah. <laughs> what a dumb fucking name. Just kidding. <laughs>